Welcome back. It's time for section two of our ecology unit. Today we're going to be talking about how... Okay, we're going to be talking about how organisms interact with each other inside of their environment. So we're going to start with talking about just one organism at a time. That man right there, he is the moray eel and he is amazing. His habitat and his niche are two different things, just like every other single organism. So the moray eel has a habitat. He lives in like tiny little caves and little parts of reefs and shipwrecks and he kind of hides in there. That's his habitat. It's just the location where he lives. That's all. His niche has a lot more to it. So the moray eel's niche includes what he eats, how he reproduces, who eats him, and how he acts on a daily basis. So it's an animal's set of behaviors. And sure, that includes where they live, but it's a whole lot more than that. So uh, a little bit about the moray eel and his niche. Um, it hides in the crevice and swims out to catch its prey. What prey, you ask? Well, the moray eel are out here eating crabs. They eat uh, squids. They eat smaller fish. And what eats the moray eel? Um, the moray eel can be eaten by sharks. Sometimes it's hunted and eaten by people. But that's pretty dangerous because some particular moray eels have this like poisonous, toxic mucus that comes off of their bodies. Super nasty. <clears throat> That's a moray. So we're going to move on and start talking about different organisms and how they communicate with each other. The first relationships we're going to be talking about are who's making the energy and who is taking the energy within an ecosystem. So every living thing needs energy stored as carbohydrates. So some organisms solve this problem by making their own carbohydrates and other organisms solve this problem by eating someone who made the carbohydrates. So we have the producers, first of all. Those are plants and algae. That's anything that produces its own carbohydrates. There's two different ways to do that. The first way is photosynthesis, and that is when we use sunlight energy and we convert that into carbohydrates. That's what we're familiar with plants doing. The second is chemosynthesis, which is brand new to us, probably. The only organisms doing that are really, really small organisms that live all the way at the bottom of the ocean where there's no sunlight at all. They're using uh, chemicals that come out of deep sea volcanic vents to create carbohydrates. All of those creatures are called producers because they create their own carbohydrates. And let's take a look at that diagram over there of the ocean. You can see the top of the ocean is labeled the photic zone. That means that's the part of the ocean that gets sunlight. Water is relatively hard to get light through compared to air. So it's only the photic zone that truly has enough light to support photosynthetic producers. That's why if you find seaweed, it's going to be in the photic zone. If you find algae, it's also going to be in the photic zone. Now, if we look all the way at the bottom of that diagram, the rest of the ocean is called the aphotic zone or the no sunlight zone. All the way at the bottom, you'll start finding the organisms that live in complete darkness, including those chemosynthetic organisms that are hanging out by the deep sea vents. So um, let's not neglect the last category of creature. This is one of the most common in our whole biosphere. These are the consumers. You, my friend, are a consumer. You cannot do photosynthesis. A consumer is any creature that eats another. So if you eat a salad, you are a consumer. If you eat a steak, you are also a consumer. That's how you get your carbohydrates. I'm sorry, but you cannot photosynthesize. We're going to take a look at this food web where we can see producers and consumers together. First, try to find a producer and identify if it's photosynthetic or chemosynthetic. On the very bottom, we have algae and we have plants, and those both live in the sunlight, so they are photosynthetic producers. So next, try to find a consumer that eats 
only producers. You're correct if you found the flagfish or maybe grass shrimp and worms, white-tailed deer, the raccoon. They're only eating plants. They're only eating producers. So we've got some herbivores in there. That's one flavor of consumer. Let's talk really quickly about the other flavors of consumer in this food web. Uh, we have some creatures that are going to eat animals and plants. Those are omnivores. We have things like the panther, which is only going to eat other animals. That is a carnivore. We have the vulture, which is a scavenger because it's only going to eat things that are already dead. And what's missing from this diagram? The decomposers and the detritivores. So if an animal dies and a vulture does not scavenge it, a decomposer is going to get its carbohydrates from breaking it down. And it's pretty helpful for our ecosystem. And detritivores are very, very similar. They uh, live on the ground. They include things like your earthworm. And they chew on, like, basically the poop of decomposers and break it down even further. A little bit more about this food web. We can start to see some patterns. Take a look at the arrows and observe in the general direction that they're pointing. Most of these arrows are pointing up, and that's a representation of how energy flows in one direction in an ecosystem. In other words, the plants can give energy to their consumers, but those consumers can't send energy back down to the plants. An apex predator, like the panther, can get energy from the deer, but it can't send energy back down another level to the deer. The deer are not going to eat a panther. So when we say energy flows in one direction through an ecosystem, we're really saying that energy flows from producers to primary consumers to secondary consumers and so on until we get to the very end of the food web are detritivores that are invisible in this diagram. I want to talk about what happens if someone leaves this food web. So let's take a look at the alligator. The alligator has a lot of arrows pointing to it. The alligator consumes the largemouth bass. It consumes the anhinga. It consumes the pink frog. The moorhen, that's kind of like a duck. It consumes raccoons. It's pretty much out there eating everything. So if we took this alligator out of the ecosystem, what would the consequences be? Well, the largemouth bass are going to be pretty excited. So the bass population will increase because there are fewer alligators eating them. Let's look at the consequences of that. If the largemouth bass population increases, that is bad news for the flagfish because the flagfish now have more predators and their population will in turn decrease. So you can see how just taking a single animal out of a food web is going to affect all of the other organisms in the food web. The effects, of course, are going to be different depending on which species it is that you remove. There is one particular kind of species that it's very dangerous to remove, and it is called a keystone species. Check out that otter. He's super cute, and he's super important to his ecosystem. The otter is known as a keystone species because if you remove him from his ecosystem, it will literally fall apart. This happened accidentally one time. So otters live in these ecosystems called kelp forests, which are underwater. There's just like a ton of kelp there. Um, and the otters eat sea urchins, which are these like pointy little sea creatures that they crack open with rocks and then they eat. When the otters were removed from the kelp forest, this chain of events happened that destroyed the food web. So there were no more otters, and then the sea urchin population exploded, and there were so many of them. And it turns out that sea urchins eat seaweed, so the sea urchins ate all the seaweed, and that destroyed the whole environment that was the habitat and home of so many fish and aquatic organisms, and the local bird population too. When we reintroduced the otters to these ecosystems, we did this on purpose, conservationists did, the ecosystems did bounce back, and hopefully, hopefully, they will be returning completely to normal very soon. 
The otter is so important to its local food web that it is called the keystone species. And if you remove it, the whole food web will fall apart and the ecosystem is largely going to be destroyed. We're going to go over some relationships between different animals and we're going to start with the obvious one and that's the predator-prey relationship. Just like the sea otters and the sea urchins, um, the otters are the predators and the urchins are the prey, we're going to be looking at the lynx and the hare. So that's a lynx. He's super beautiful. The hare is also very cute, which makes this difficult to think about, but lynx eat hares. We're going to look at a graphical representation of predators and prey over time. So we're going to put year on the x-axis because that's our independent variable. We're looking at how things change over time. We want to see the hare population and the lynx population, both. So we're going to put both of those on the y-axis. So there's just the hares by themselves. And now here come the lynx. Now we have a scatter plot, but we can't see any patterns yet because these dots aren't connected. I'm going to click line, line graph to help me start seeing patterns. It's not beautiful yet. This data is really, really squished together. Let me see what I can do to spread out our graph. Take a moment, look at this graph, and make at least one observation about what you see and what that means for hares and lynxes. My number one observation when I first look at this is, okay, the hares are red lines and the lynx are that kind of purple blue. Well, the hare population can get way higher than the lynx population. So I guess that means the prey species can have way more individuals than the predator species. That makes sense because there always have to be enough prey for the predators to eat. And it's not like the lynx are out there eating one hare a year. They're eating a bunch. Let's take a look for some more patterns. You can see that right after the peak of the prey hare population, we see a peak in the lynx population about four years later. So that happens once, twice, and then a third time. That makes sense because the more food is available, the more lynx are going to survive and reproduce to the next year. Let's find another cycle. Let's see what happens when the hare population decreases. So right after the hare population decreases, the lynx population starts to decrease as well. And that also makes perfect sense. The fewer food sources there are, the fewer lynx are going to survive. So you can observe in this graph how predator and prey relationships exist in a sort of cycle. Now imagine what would happen if we removed all of the lynx from this whole ecosystem. The graph would start to look totally different. There would not be any predators for the hare, and so that red line would go up higher than it's ever gone before. We think that maybe that line would flatten out because the hares are going to be limited by their own food source and they can't just keep their population growing forever. That's enough of that graph and enough of predator and prey. We're going to dig into the fun stuff, which is symbioses. These are the happy, friendly, usually, relationships between species in an ecosystem. There are three flavors of symbiosis. There's commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. In symbiosis, there's always at least one organism that's really stoked to be in the relationship. In commensalism, one animal is stoked and is benefiting a lot, and the other one is just kind of unaffected, and they don't really care either way. They're having an all right time. Doesn't matter to them. Next, we have mutualism, which is the best because both creatures are benefiting. And last, we have parasitism, which I'm sure you've heard of before, which is when one creature benefits and the other one suffers. We're going to look at three examples. First of all, we got a whale. He's covered in barnacles. Now, the whale is huge. Does he know that there's barnacles on him? Probably not but those barnacles get a lovely moving habitat to live in. So this is a fantastic example of commensalism. The whale does not care. He doesn't give a hoot. Next. Heck yeah, Finding Nemo has arrived. 
Here we have clownfish, and they protect the sea anemone from potential predators. Now the sea anemone actually does the exact same job for the clownfish because it has certain toxins that are poisonous to other types of fish that would like to eat the clownfish. So what I'm telling you is the anemone benefits and the clownfish benefits. That right there is mutualism. That's the specific type of symbiosis. Last one. This one's disgusting. Uh, this is a fish with a little gross bug parasite thing inside of him. So the bug like latches onto the fish's tongue. That's right, apparently fish have tongues. And it eats the fish's tongue and stays there in its mouth. It's like it becomes the tongue. So super nasty. This is an example of parasitism. Other famous ones are ticks and tapeworms, and I'm sure that you guys have heard of those before. That's all for that section. Hop into office hours if you want to.